shed light on this statement bhava dvaitam sada kuryat kriya dvaitam na karhichit no kriya dvaitam sada kuryat bhava dvaitam na karhichit advaita so a student is told that when you are interacting with people respect the duality But in your mind, have the attitude of non-duality. So, bhava dvaitam sada kuryat, no, kriya dvaitam sada kuryat, or bhava advaitam sada kuryat, or advaita in your attitude. And kriya dvaitam, so kriya dvaitam you should always have in kriya, there should not be an non-duality that you and I are one and therefore you can walk into anybody's house and you know, don't do that. Respect the diversity that exists in Yohara without giving it reality in your own mind. In your own mind you do not give reality but at the same time respect the, the apparent reality in the Yohara. And they follow the rules of Vyavahara. That's what is meant. And so with Guru you should never have, you always you should have duality that way. In your, in your behavior, always respect him. With others, you should, should not have in your mind. With Guru, even in Bhavana also there is duality, that Guru and Shishya. Others, duality as far as the Vyavahara is concerned, but not in your attitude. <clears throat> Millions of years ago when human beings brain was not developed they could not have knowledge hence no moksha for so many, many years, for so many jivas. But when the brain is not developed, there is no bondage also, understand? The bondage also is for developed because the, all the lower, you know, embodiments they don't have bondage because they don't suffer from this sense of individuality, ego, raga, dvesha, etc. It's all the gift of the developed brain that we have so many complexes about ourselves. So that is the price we pay for the evolution. Human being the most evolved and therefore having the most self-consciousness and therefore the most judgment, self-judgment or complex is about oneself which is of the nature of bondage which is what causes unhappiness. Brain is not developed so there is also not there. So ignorance is bliss. So they did not need moksha. There must be some path of moksha for non-Hindus as well. For every human being. Hindus would like to think that ultimately they should be born in India, be exposed to this tradition, then only moksha can be there. But that the knowledge can be there anywhere because this is an ongoing process. Lord Krishna says that whatever we accomplished in this lifetime, in a given lifetime, in terms of emotional maturity, spiritual maturity, that stays with us. 
in the next verse also. And then we continue from that point on. So the next birth can be anywhere. I see you couldn't be born. And so there are saints say, everywhere in, in all the you know parts of the world. So uh, knowledge can take place, so it can be very close to take place. It is true that liberation will take place by knowing your true nature, knowing the nature of Ishwara. I found myself to be over accommodating for most of my life. Maybe in part due to being born in such a differential culture. A natural reaction to that in the present is at times to overemphasize myself, my wishes, my desire. I used to let go. And so now I assert, I guess a compensation, I guess. Please provide guidance on things to consider, to remain alert and balanced, to avoid both over accommodation and over emphasis of the self. This reaction that is there in the present of overemphasizing myself comes from a sense of deprivation that I feel I had in the past. Over accommodating means letting go, allowing people to walk over me or to have their sway over me. Now I realize that that was not fair to me. And so perhaps the mind now compensates by asserting in the opposite direction. The way to deal with this is to understand our mind. That yes, I overemphasize myself, I assert myself, why am I doing it? If I feel that, it is to compensate or a reaction of what I went through in the past. Then I will also recognize that this also does not solve the problem. That I allow myself to be controlled by the others, by others, by dominated by others, for whatever reason, it is because of culture, because of my nature, circumstances, But I have to accept that past. Inasmuch as it is what my karma may have needed for me to go through and so best is not to hold on to the hurts of the past. If I feel that I was wronged, that the world was unfair to me, there is not justice towards me, which could very well be. But then I am carrying the hurt from that, because that time I was helpless. And now I realize that it was unfair to me. But now, what I should do in the present is to objectively see that situation And recognize that other people did what they did because of their nature or because of the circumstances. And the way to overcome the sense of hurt 
is I need to forgive those people who hurt me. See, people dominate others, control others. That's the usual thing. The strong usually dominate or control the weaker. And this is from the time beginning less. It was there, is there and will be there also, unfortunately. We may have been a victim of this tendency. But retaining that past, retaining that sense of hurt does not help me or anybody. Therefore, I should try to overcome that by recognizing that other people had their own problems. See, when I dominate others, control others, it is from some lack or want or pain from myself in within myself that makes me do that. A happy person will not control others, will not dominate others. A happy person will be kind to others. When I dominate, I control, I'm not sensitive to the feelings of others. Because that insensitivity shows a hidden pain within me. An unhappy person alone will create unhappiness for others. A happy person will not do that. So, from now at this time, from an objective standpoint, I can see that all those who dominated me controlled me, hurt me, also were people in pain. Outwardly, one looks dominating and strong. Inwardly, there is weakness and pain. A, a strong person is a happy person. Only a happy person can be strong in the true sense. A happy person cannot hurt other persons. So, the fact that I was victim of other people's actions because of their insensitivity towards my sentiments, it shows that they also were in pain, whether they recognized it or not. And so, responding to the person behind the behavior, the behavior creates in me a sense of retaliation. I am retaliating right now of you know, compensating by doing what others did to me, perhaps. But if I look at the person behind the behavior, all those people who I thought were hurting me, they were also hurt and in pain. And therefore they deserve my forgiveness. So the hurt can be dealt with by kshama or forgiveness towards the people who hurt me by recognizing that their hurtful behavior emerge from their own inner pain or hurt. If I see that then there will be sympathy for them and kshama or accommodation will be possible. When that account is settled, then I won't see the need of dominating others. No need to retaliate and no need to react. Otherwise, uh, in villages, you know, children are brought up sometimes, they are abused by their parents. That mother, when she grows up, then she similarly abuses her child, the other, you know. Because you do to others what was done to you. So if I do the same thing what that was done to me, that doesn't solve the problem. So rather than reacting in that way, compensating the hurt, the best way is to neutralize the hurt by pratipaksha bhavana, by the opposite or contrary feeling of kshama or forgiveness which arises from understanding. Not I forgive you, not that I understand. 
that you deserve, meaning in my own mind, my forgiveness because I see that this person is in pain, even the outer behavior may be anything, inwardly there is pain. Then you won't see the need to dominate others or, or compensate for what was done to you. Is it more appropriate to say I am part of God instead of I am God? If you are feeling that you are part of God, it's quite all right. But you can remind that ultimately God cannot have parts. He's indivisible and undivided. So there God or consciousness cannot be cut into parts that I am one part, you are another part, third part, then no God is left. But I still feel like a part, you can respect your feeling. At the same time, recognizing that this feeling arises not from knowledge. And so someday I will have to overcome this feeling by recognizing my true nature. So if you feel you are a part of God, that's all right, function that way. But not that I want to perpetuate that, being a fraction or part of God. Because being a part doesn't make me very happy. I still feel a part, small, insignificant. And so ultimately I should become free from, I will need to become free from that. So I, there is not appropriate that I am part or I am, I am God. It's not a pro, it's what you feel. Feel you are a part of God, start from there. And do whatever a part of God will do. So ultimately that complex of my being a part also, slowly I overcome. Why do we have a mind of this nature, jumping from one place to another, searching for happiness? Why is it so? Because the poor mind does not find happiness from within. It needs happiness. This teenager son comes home every evening, says, Mama, I'm not hungry. Doesn't eat food at home. Then this went on for some time, then the father investigated, this fellow goes to Pizza Hut and uh, Taco Bell, this uh, every evening. And, and then comes home and says, I'm not hungry. How can he be hungry? What's the reason why he's eating? Because he doesn't like what is cooked at home. The way to stop him from eating out is to make it attractive for him to eat at home. cook good food at home, then there will be no need for him to go out. So, so mind all the time runs out because doesn't find any satisfaction inside. Therefore, it is necessary to create satisfaction by living life of karma yoga, worship, values. All these are taught to us to create antakana shuddhi, some freedom from the Raghadvesha to the extent that it is done to the extent mind will discover happiness from itself then it won't run out we can't blame the mind for running out because it, it it's hungry doesn't get what it wants from inside so it runs out it's nature of anybody. We will also go away. I mean, where, where we are not interested, we will always want to go someplace which is more interesting. I mean, we need vacation. So, we have to need vacation. So, let us get, get away from home for some time. Get away from this place. Because this place, whatever is good, but still, my need is not satisfied with that. I need to go someplace, do something else. 
and therefore living a life of karma yoga, of values, attitudes taught in Bhagavad Gita, will create an inner purification, inner satisfaction, and the mind will become more and more inward looking. Why are we born ignorant? Why are we born ignorant? I don't know. Otherwise we won't be born. It's because of ignorance that we are born. There is no creation, no birth, nothing if there is no ignorance. Because a wise person doesn't know to be born, need to be born. So Bhagavan is this ignorance is there for the samsara to go on. So cycle of birth and that takes place and the world goes on. I guess. So there's no answer to the question why we are ignorant. That's what it is. No answer to that question. If ignorance is the cause, then uh, if the cause goes away, ignorance goes away, ignorance will not go unless the opposite, the knowledge comes. Why is there darkness? There are caves with their darkness from the beginning of the creation. Why is, why is the darkness there? It will only go when the light comes. Swamiji, you mentioned that love becomes more firm when there is a physical act, there is an act. Not only physical act. Or Swamiji just say, verbalize or your or physicalize your attitudes. What is in your mind, let it be expressed in the form of action. Not only physical action, action at the level, physical level, oral level or mental level. But then it becomes firm. If I say the physical act, it should include also the other actions. <coughs> What lessens the binding effect of karma more effectively? The mindset attitude or the declining degree of physicality in the act? Well, I do not know declining degree of physicality in act. So, if physicality is declining, then what is increasing? But basically what makes the karma, binding effect of karma is lessened, what is not karma that binds, it is self-centeredness that binds. You call it karma or self-centeredness, that is what binds. Karma does not bind. But when we are about to do something, our utilitarian mind asks a question, what is in it for me? The mind asks, what is in it for me? Mind, ego. So that is what is binding. If I can tell the mind, it's not done for you. You do for something. Enough is done for you. Which is true. Enough has been done for me. Our Puja Swami would say, the body is given to me. Organs of perception are given to me. Organs of action are given to me. Mind is given to me, intellect is given to me, the power of knowledge is given to me, power to will is given to me, power to act, all is all given to me. If I recognize what all is given to me, then there will be a sense of gratitude. Then I will not see the need of begging, I will then see the need of giving because already so much is given to me. So it's this attitude that my act becomes an opportunity for me to return the favor. I'm not actually obliging anybody. Already favor has been done to me and returning the favor. So that attitude will lessen the binding effect of karma. 
No selfishness, no bondage. Less selfishness, less bondage. Is the use of chanting to focus the mind inherently a form of worship or does chanting for focus require a pre-existing attitude of worship? Chanting is an act. Act does not mean worship. Worship is the attitude which I have in my mind. And a given action may be more suitable for invoking that attitude. The attitude of love can be invoked when I give something to somebody. If I slap somebody, that can't you know, invoke the attitude of love in me. So a given action may be more compatible to invoke a certain attitude. So chanting can be one. But chanting does not necessarily mean devotion. People can also chants. Anybody chants as a profession. A mere action does not mean devotion. The chanting is a very suitable action to invoke the devotee in me provided I have that attitude. So chanting can be done for learning, chanting can be done for uh, focusing the mind also. And chanting also can be done out of the attitude of devotion. So that's that in the, my mind, that's what determines. To better understand the beauty of Advaita Vedanta, can you briefly state the premise behind Advaita, I say Advaita Vedanta's attempt to provide liberation? What is this? Advaita Vedanta's attempt to provide liberation? I don't know whether Advaita Vedanta attempts to provide liberation or teaches us what liberation is and helps us attain the liberation. What Advaita Vedanta says is that you are what you are seeking in your life. Liberation is what you are seeking. There is what you already are. So you have to just know your true nature for the liberation is that you are seeking. That is the praptasya praptihi, attainment of what is already attained. That is the premise of Vedanta. How to become a person of equanimity and maturity? To truly engage in Nishkama Karma. The world is too much with us, you know. <laughs> so, the way the world treats me does not allow me to become, to have the attitude of Nishkama Karma, become selfless. The world is too much. So it depends on what we mean by the world is too much for with us. When the world keeps putting pushing buttons, I guess that's what is meant by too much. Pushes buttons. Sometimes it makes me angry. Sometimes it makes me greedy. Sometimes it creates you know retaliation. Sometimes hatred. Sometimes attachment. The world does that. But world only can push the button. Just because you push button doesn't mean that the light will come on. Will it come on? You push button, light will come on? Is that a rule? 
that you switch on, the light will come on. Is there a rule? What's the rule? Electricity, what else should be there? The wiring should be there, is it not so? The fan also, push the button, doesn't mean the fan will run if there is no wiring. So world can push buttons. To remove the wiring is our job. The ragged piece of the wiring. And that is where we have to work on. World is what it is and it will remain what it is. We can't change the world. It is you and I have, we have very limited capacity to change what we, best is to change ourselves and try to remove the wiring of Raga and Dvesha. That's how you maintain equanimity and that's called maturity of, in our words of Puja Swamiji, emotional maturity is the capacity to manage one's own Raga and Dvesha. Not managed by them, but to manage them. Meaning that, if a thought of Raga or Dvesha comes to my mind, I do not get swayed by that. A thought I can neutralize and proceed with it. So we should attain a grain, that kind of maturity that I am not controlled by the thoughts arising in my mind. I become aware of the thought and neutralize the thought. That's the process. And then more and more equanimity we get, more and more maturity we get, more and more, we'll less and less will be controlled by the world. It says that non-performance of nitya karma means duty. What is duty? Duty is what I am required to do. What I am obliged to do. What makes me obliged? Because I have received some favor from you. And therefore I should do what is necessary to return the favor. What is duty? Returning the favor. So when I do something for my parents, I'm returning the favor, not doing favor to them. So the idea of duty arises from the understanding that we are receiving lots of favors. We have received and we continue to receive. Therefore it's our duty to return that favor. That's called Nitya Karma. So Mimam Sika say that Akarane pratyavaya, if you fail to perform what is right, then you are incurring sin or papa. In a given situation, a situation expects a certain response from me. If I don't respond, then outwardly I have not done anything, but inwardly I have not done what I should have done. And that, that also causes papa. So I'm supposed to do what I'm required to do, not cop out. That copying out, dropping out, not facing a situation also has negative consequences. That's what Mimam Sagas mean. And so omissions and commissions, omission, not doing what is to be commission, doing what should not be done, omission, not doing what should be done. Both of these attract Papa. And all the problems in the world are due to our omissions and commissions. We are doing what we should not be doing and not doing what we should be doing. It all piles up into the problems of the world. Whether it is global warming, it is various crises that is coming in the universe, some wars, hunger, all of this is because Humanity did not do what it should have done or did what it should not have done. Omission and commission 
both have negative effects. That is why they say that you should refrain from omission and commission both. You should do what you have to do. According to verse 4, ritualistic worship is given more importance compared to chanting followed by meditation. It doesn't say that. Poojanam japaha chintanam kramat uttamam. Poojanam ritualistic worship, japaha chanting and chintanam meditation. In that order, so the chanting or worship at the oral level is superior to the worship at the physical level because it requires more focus and concentration. So verse does not say that ritualistic worship is more important than oral worship. A certain order to rituals and that order or structure is not known to many. How do you suggest solving this problem? See, this Poojanam, these rituals are something that we have to learn about. There is a complaint about the Hindu traditions, too much ritualistic. Worship is too much ritualistic. There's peace, peace, do so many things. Right? We don't understand what's going on. So there seems to be a certain amount of, I should not say aversion, but a little indifference towards the rituals, even aversion also. Too much rituals. So we complain about the rituals which are involved in the act of worship. Dhyanam, I said the 16 steps are there in that sequence. And we have, why do we have these rituals in worship? My question is, is making tea a ritual or not? Should you follow certain steps? Making soup, making bhakri, making chapati, making tea? That's why they don't let me do anything because if you mess up your sequence, it will turn out to be something else. Is it not that for anything to be done properly, you must follow a certain sequence? That's called a ritual. So, so also in Varshi, we will follow a certain sequence. That's called a ritual. So, cooking is a big ritual. Is it not so? How much preparation, Swamiji, this is going in my garden, this house specially saved for this in and this much quantity will be required and so it has been preserved and set aside, transported, stored here properly, cleaned, washed. Big ritual, is it not so? For what? For dal, sabji, roti, chawal? Yeah. So everything is ritual. This is also a ritual. I am sitting here, you are sitting there, asking questions, written, I'm answering, sort of ritual. Then things go systematically. Otherwise there is no order at all. No, there will be no order of vivastha. And therefore, there are always rituals in everything that we do in life. Because we do them every day, it doesn't appear like a ritual. And because it's pujanam, we don't particularly care, so therefore we complain about rituals. But rituals are not absolutely necessary, they can be simplified also. Important the spirit of worship is most important, but ritual is given to us so that we can systematically express our feelings. Most saints and mercies are seen in contemplations and meditation and not a ritualistic worship. So again, back to the question, why is the order important? Order is that you 
You know, when you were when learning, riding bicycle, in the beginning, that somebody standing behind me and holding the bicycle and so that I don't fall down, I can maintain the balance. You can just leave it, then I fall down. And then you hurt, you hurt your legs or knees. Then slowly you get balanced. But with both these both hands, you know, I hold on to that handle, governor. Then slowly with practice, I'm more comfortable with one hand. The hero champions do that, you know, with the raised hands. Isn't there a sequence? As you get more and more maturity or control, then naturally then becomes, that's why the stages change. So you graduate from physical worship to chanting and oral worship, from there to mental worship. That's why the sequence is there, one follows the other. Doesn't mean that you have to follow the order, you can do what you want. But in general, one is preparing first step, is preparing for second step, preparing for third step. And preparation for freedom from all actions also. Prayers. Are mantras helpful to remove ignorance? Yes. But mantras chanted with devotion will be more helpful. Mantras chanted with devotion is more helpful, more effective. Mantras themselves also have effect. Even if you don't understand, they have effect. If you do it with understanding, with a proper feeling, it will be more effective. We seek to drop the ego I. We seek to drop self-loathing criticism. We seek to drop hurt and sorrow. We seek to do what is needed and nothing else. Well, a cow, for instance, already received all this. Cow has no ego, does not criticize itself, has no hurt, no sorrow. So how can we claim we are a better evolved creature than cow? Isn't that right? Hmm? So should we become cows? But a stone is even better than cow, is it not so? A rock is better than cow also. Cow has some feeling at least. There's hunger and thirst and heat and cold and poor thing has also disease and pain. A stone doesn't have anything. Would it not be better? Cow has selfless love. Cow has selfless love? I know. Because cow is not involved enough to have selfishness. The infant has selfless love. Let it wait for two, three years, then you'll find out. And sweet 16, 18, you were two years it has said, please shut off that, do I have to? Starts asking question. So thing which was giving you unconditional love starts showing conditions. It's all there. It's not evolved enough to express those conditions. So car is not evolved enough. So when we are evolved, this is all the mark of evolution. Sorrow is mark of evolution. Hurt and guilt are mark of evolution. So that seems to be, you know, that's all unhappiness, yes. So we know what unhappiness is, then we can strive to become free from any cow will never strive. We don't feel bondage, there is no need to liber for liberation also. So evolution means we feel the bondage. We feel the pain of bondage, then we want to become free from that. Then moksha is there.
So superiority is not claim, not claim because of sorrow or freedom from sorrow. Superiority is claim because of the viveka, the intellect that we have to discriminate, to learn and to grow. Cow will never learn. Every, for centuries cow is eating only grass, is it not so? If you and I were there, we would like to cook the grass, is it not? And spice it also. Cow never does it. A sparrow keeps on building, the, the, you know, some straw it brings and it falls down and brings. Never learns. There's no architect there. Same kind of thing, they get nest, they keep on building. No growth, no evolution. Look at human beings. And so evolution is not measured just because you don't feel sorry, sorrow if you know sensitivity also. That you feel hurt and guilt shows your sensitivity. If there is not there, you don't feel hurt and guilt. Even an infant may not feel guilty or hurt or nothing. That doesn't mean because it's not evolved. So you have to pay the price of evolution. Because that pain is required for us to become, to have the desire to become free from pain. Desiring more and more, is this always a bad thing? For example, for instance, I desire to learn about self. I seem to be never satisfied with what I have learned. And I do not even know what will satisfy that need perfectly. What should I do? Continue to learn. I desire to learn about the self. Please continue until you learn. Let this desire to learn will result in learning and learning will knowing and that will give you complete satisfaction when you will become free from desires Some actions are always for consumption and not contribution. We eat for survival. We travel for pleasure. Thereby causing harm to nature. These actions will also have an outcome. To remain still without eating food is the only action then without phalam to stop gati. Since Ishwara has given us the body and given us hunger and thirst by default, therefore it is quite in order to satisfy, quench the thirst and appease the hunger. Now then you can minimize the consumption. So nobody can survive without consuming. Whatever living being is created will survive only when it consumes from the nature. What we can do is to minimize the consumption. Make your food, you know, not more than what you need, as simple as it can be. So, as far as survival is concerned, we can minimize the consumption, not eliminate consumption. Travel for pleasure? No, that is a different matter. That is a choice. There is no choice by default, there is hunger. There is no choice in hunger and thirst, so we have to satisfy that. With travel, it, it's a matter of choice. And other things, not that you should not travel, but as I said, where choice is involved, you to consider whether this choice is in keeping with freedom or is it binding. A day can come when you won't even need, you, you, you discover your true nature, then you are actionless, then you don't perform any action, then you are totally free from action. <coughs> wow. 
Why does the Lord have to own laws of nature? Why cannot one say that the laws of nature determine the outcome of an action? If creator created the universe, then who created the creator? Well, this was discussed in the last uh, retreat in the course of discussing the first verse that to determine the outcome of an action requires intelligence. To take into account all the factors that are involved in performance of an action to determine what the proper outcome should be. That requires one to take into account all the factors that contributed to performance of an action. If you know all of that, then only you can determine what the outcome will be. That requires omniscience, all knowledge. Action doesn't have the action itself is unconscious, doesn't have that. Therefore, Ishwara, who is omniscient, is one who can decide what the right outcome is. If creator created the universe, then who created the creator? Why well, is there a rule that something, everything must be created? Who created the creator? Whoever created, then he will be creator. Who created him? There is endless. This is called infinite regression. So creator must be uncreated. You know, it has to be that way. All right, I think tonight we will conclude here. Maybe we can carry on these questions tomorrow. in the folder B this one menu this is B huh this is B we want to see Let me check. Recorder. Okay, now. Folder C. Okay.